message in a couple of PGP key fingerprints. Let's go ahead. All right. The problem that voting pools solve. Uh, a lot of people mentioned they've been in Bitcoin for a while, so maybe you've heard of some of these names like Bitcoinica, MyBitcoin.com, Bitfloor, InstaWallet, Mt. Gox. Has anyone not heard of Mt. Gox? <laughs> Starting in uh, 2011, when Bitcoin first re got its real decent exchange rate and publicity, thieves figured out that Bitcoins were valuable, and anything that's valuable is worth stealing. And all of the features that make Bitcoin good currency, you know, how you can send it you know, anywhere in the world instantaneously, also make it very uh, good to steal. So we've seen a, pretty much an unstopping trend of all the different ways you can think of to steal bitcoins or lose them because it involves cryptography if you do the cryptography wrong you can lose private keys bitcoins are permanently gone insiders can steal bitcoins from an exchange of employees uh, the employees of hosting companies where you hold your servers can steal the bitcoins um, maybe maybe you can get hacked and not disclose it and then try to recover uh, try to recover the losses through trading fees all of these things have happened before and it's an ongoing problem that still to this day is not solved and we're going to talk about how we can use voting pools to solve it right. kind of talk about some of the sources of the problem bitcoin is a completely trustless system with no authority who can undo transactions or reverse them or anything like that and that's different than what most people are used to uh, most of the cases where people are accustomed in typical financial situations of giving custody of their funds to someone else, that feels natural to them because it's needed. It's the only way to work in the legacy financial system. The, most of these things can be solved in ways that don't require central servers, they don't require third party holding of funds, but this is a, a paradigm shift that has not been fully processed yet. It's going to take a long time before people understand this new paradigm of doing things on their own without servers. So while that is going on, there's going to be people storing their funds in centralized servers who have the, who then expose themselves to loss. The other, oh, the last point though is the the exponential growth in the the user base. What we've noticed is people who've been in Bitcoin for a while learn about holding on to their own bitcoins and not uh, giving them to a third party but the, the, the bitcoin users are growing exponentially and our ability to educate them is apparently a linear function so it's always falling behind there's always new people coming in who don't understand the dangers uh, of giving their coins over to third parties and, and why they should hold on to it themselves so, in order to create the solution for how do we how do we, if we can't make third party storage of funds perfectly safe, how, at least how do we make it decently safe? Uh, we need the multi sig features in the blockchain. And a multi sig is a concept where you have funds that uh, require multiple signatures to spend. So it's not just one entity who controls them, it's a, anywhere from 1 to 15 signatures that are required to spend certain coins. That lets you distribute the decision making amongst multiple parties. The other part we need is auditing. If you, in the tip of, I'm going to talk about exchanges. They're not the only uses of voting pools, but they're the primary ones that we will talk about now. You, there's two things you have to audit to really know if an exchange is solvent. You need to know how many coins does it have, and that needs to be provable. And you also need to know how many does it owe its customers, which also needs to be equally provable. And as far as preventing bad behavior by any exchange, whether it's because of a malicious operator or a hacked server, all decisions that have to be made must be made multilaterally, which means there's never a case where a single entity is, the controlling, uh, is making the controlling decision. Go into multi-sig. That's uh, touched on it briefly before. In bit, in the Bitcoin and all the currencies that are derived from it, you get up to 15 signatures that can be required for a specific coin. And it's uh, we describe multi-sig outputs in terms of m of n. M being the number of signatures required, 
and n being the number of potential signatures. For example, two of three, that's the most normal case, or three of five, or any number up to 15 of 15. And the, the choice of m, the, the number of required signatures, is a, is a balancing act. In general, you want it to be more than a majority. You, you want more than a majority vote to release funds, but you, there's, there's a balance where on the one side, if you, make a, if you make the M smaller, like close to one half, that means as many, sir, as many signatures can be absent as, and still spend the funds. That protects you from denial of service. You know, if let's say a service is down because the electricity went out or they've been DDoSed or whatever, the rest of the pool can still operate. But if you have a bigger M, closer to 100% of the keys, now uh, it's harder for a malicious actor to do something wrong with the funds because they have to convince more people to go along with them or they have to hack more private keys. So there's, there's a certain balance in this M of M scheme. Okay. Proof of reserves is the easiest part of the problem. That's simple, you just post a list of addresses and uh, add the appropriate signatures to prove that you, the same entity controls them. That's, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing some exchanges implement proof of reserves now because that is the simplest problem to solve. Next. Proof of liabilities is where the difficulty comes in. You, ideally, you want the proof of liabilities to be unimpeachable, which means nobody can lie Nobody can forge records. Nobody can just arbitrarily change balances. This does not exist yet in any deployed Bitcoin exchange. Um, most of these exchanges, they're using simple databases to store their customer records. Might be a simple, just a single MySQL table that has a list of customers and what their balance is. No, there's no cryptographic integrity, uh, no uh, multilateral decision making. It's just they can alter that at will. The technology that fills in this missing piece is Open Transactions. Open Transactions does is a financial cryptography library. It implements what's called triple entry accounting. Triple entry accounting means that whenever, whenever two entities exchange funds, there ends up being three digital signatures on that transaction. The two parties involved and a notary. And that happens with every transaction that occurs in an open transaction system. Uh, the, one, the one good thing about open transactions as opposed to some other accounting systems that are blockchain based is open transactions is fast. It doesn't require a 10 minute confirmation time. And uh, that makes it fast enough for exchanges that want to be able to do trading faster than what a blockchain can handle. Yeah, the more about open transactions. It is a client server model. It is not a blockchain. It, uh, I already mentioned that the, the servers are notaries. They're not authorities. They, the users in open transactions create their own receipts and then the server signs off of them as being calculated correctly. It separates the powers between issuers and holders and servers. Each one has a distinct role and they can be located in different jurisdictions like uh, Certain parts of the world are more friendly towards running a transaction server, so you can put the transaction servers there, but the issuers don't have to be there. The issuers can be anywhere in the world. The holders can be anywhere in the world. Uh, you can get, you know, design the most uh, legally advantageous sys way of setting up your, your system, but it does have a different security model. Blockchains are optimized to prevent error, to prevent uh, incorrect transactions at all costs. They have to stop them, and you put a lot of work into stopping them because there is no central authority who can reverse a transaction. So that's kind of why blockchains are slow, just because of the nature of the problem they're solving. The open transaction security model doesn't prevent all, all types of fraud, but what it does do is it makes any type of misbehavior detectable. And then there are various ways you can recover from, the act, from a bad actor. So two different security models. For stop incorrect actions at all costs versus detect them and make them recoverable. One of the features of open transactions is users always control their own private keys. That's what makes the security model possible. That's, why, that what makes, that's what makes it impossible for servers to cheat because they cannot sign receipts on behalf of a user. And uh, 
that does present a usability problem in, the ter in terms of password recovery because we know that users forget their passwords. And uh, the, this isn't currently implemented yet, but the plan is in Open Transactions to implement pa uh, kind of a peer-to-peer -peer password recovery or a user-selectable password recovery at the client level and not give the server access to that. Okay. Merger. This is where we bring the two parts together. We have, if you take a group of transaction servers in OT, each one of which assume it's run by an exchange, and you arrange them in a way that mirrors the structure. So let's say you get five Bitcoin exchanges, they all run five transaction servers, and then they store all their user funds in, say, a three of five outputs. So now, all of the deposits come in into these addresses, but no individual server can spend them. It takes three out of five to do it. What this means is all of these pool members have to audit each other and only release funds if they're confident and they can prove that, ever, that the server where the withdrawal is coming from has processes counting correctly. This is real-time auditing that's happening on a constant basis. One of the consequences of this is that we've, voting pools can be thought of as a way to turn distrust into security. So as a user, if they're looking at a voting pool and they're, they're, they want to put their funds in a service that's part of a voting pool, they should evaluate the members of that pool and how much they distrust each other. And the more they distrust each other, the more confident the users can be that those servers have the right incentives to not let anyone cheat. So ideally, the, you want a pool where the members absolutely hate each other, where they're at each other's throats, they're just, they're just waiting for someone to scam them, because then you know they're not going to let any audit uh, fail in, in the slightest way. Okay, talk about some of the technical features of voting pools. This is some of the things that we've looked at. Uh, we've been examining problems that Bitcoin's exchanges have had, particularly Mt. Gox. You know, Mt. Gox is the highest volume exchange, moving lots of Bitcoins, lots of users. They ran into a lot of problems. So if we're also going to solve the security problem, let's try to solve some performance problems, too. One of the ways we do that is uh, the, cold, the way we handle cold storage in a voting pool. For those who don't know, cold storage is when you have bitcoins and the private keys are not on a computer connected to the internet. And that's a basic safety feature. Uh, you'll see if you look at uh, exchanges now, they'll advertise a percentage of cold storage. So they'll say that 95% of our customer funds are kept offline. And what they're saying is that a hacker who breaks into their server, at most, could only steal 5% of the deposits because the rest of them are on keys that are just not accessible. The typical model for exchanges is they accept deposits to what's called the hot wallet. That's the ones that are online. And they'll keep it at a certain size. And, and they will periodically sweep their funds from the hot wallet to cold storage. That works, uh, but it has some disadvantages. Uh, if there's high deposit withdrawal volumes, you can get cases where a transaction is unconfirmed and then they try to spend it and it never gets confirmed. That's the transaction malleability that Mt. Gox tried to blame everything on. That is a problem that can happen. So this, the, the voting pool system uses first in, first out cold storage. What this means is user deposits go directly to cold storage. And the withdrawals are processed from the oldest addresses. We make deposit addresses in batches. And we pull the oldest ones online as needed and accept you know, accept deposits to the addresses that will be used weeks in the future. What this means is that the, co the coins being withdrawn are old. They'll, that means they require lower transaction fees. You're well past the interval of which there could be a blockchain fork. It's just uh, the most reliable way to withdraw. And we don't reuse addresses. Uh, crediting. We uh, have a formula for determining when a transaction server will credit a user for a deposit. Uh, one thing that's uh, a problem, a new problem that voting pools introduce is that uh, crediting of deposits is non-reversible in open transactions. You can't revoke a receipt. So you have to be absolutely sure that you don't give a user credit for their deposit 
until you know that it's really in and you're not going to lose it due to a, a chain fork or double spending. So using that formula based on the deposit size, you can estimate the amount of risk of when you can credit the user. And you can make sure that the services have sufficient reserve to cover any uh, double spends if such a thing were to happen. And using these formulas, we can keep the pool solvent in a worst case scenario as long as any chain fork is less than 100 blocks, which is longer than any that's ever happened in Bitcoin. Uh, withdrawals. Uh, withdrawals are, are integral to the auditing process. So all these members of the pool are cross-auditing each other, and that's how they see the withdrawal request come across. And once they've verified that the audit is correct, everything has been done correctly, they batch the withdrawals uh, and process them uh, once every five minutes. They pool with all the validated withdrawals, they make sure at least M members of the pool have seen it and agree. And then they send that out to their wallets to process these in big transaction batches. So if, uh, if you're withdrawing from a pool, you should, you should see the funds come out you know, no more than five minutes after your withdrawal. And we'll, we have an algorithm to minimize the number of transactions that are involved with that. Some of the other technologies that are involved in making voting pools work. BitMessage. BitMessage is a peer-to-peer -peer communication system that's inspired by Bitcoin. We use BitMessage as a way to reduce the attack surface. Like one of the things we know about running an exchange is all of the elite criminal hackers in the world will try to break that exchange. So anything we can do to, to make it harder for them or to slow them down a little bit will uh, help the security of the pool. The servers that do the auditing are actually separate from the transaction servers, and they only communicate to the transaction server through BitMessage, which means that any attacker who breaks into the website and the public-facing transaction server doesn't know where to find that audit server. So if you can't find it, that's, you know, that's a whole class of attacks that would never happen, because they don't know where to get to the, to the audit server where the hot wallet is. Uh, colored coins are a feature that's necessary to make this work. Um, the, the nature of the voting pool contracts are different than regular open transactions asset contracts in that they have to change over time. One of the ways we do that is we use a smart property, which is a colored coin feature. Uh, ultimately, colored coins will have greater applications in OT. Is that's one way you can make assets uh, federatable across multiple servers. Uh, and the payment protocol, that's a new feature that came out in Bitcoin Core 0.9. It's a standard format for passing payment information from servers to customers. And we will use that in order to supply deposit addresses to people who want to load funds into the pool. Okay, if you want to know more about voting pools and how they're developed, uh, the wiki is kind of our reference documentation. Uh, it's being used to flesh out the protocol, explain how everything works. On the Freenode IRC network, you can join the Open Transactions channel, talk to all the developers around the world involved in Open Transactions. And we have the otblog.net, which will a series of news about Open Transactions in general. All right, next one. Questions? No questions. Everybody perfectly understands voting pools. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so probably the answer because it's the first time I've heard of this. Uh, so what, what does it mean for servers to distrust each other? I mean, so, so what do they like? Like, uh, okay, can you explain what that means? So if they're competitors in the same industry. Um, for example, uh, what are some, Bitstamp is an exchange, uh, Kraken, local Bitcoins, Coinbase. These are services that all uh, they're owned by different people, they compete in the same space, and they would have an incentive if they were part of a voting pool to make sure that the other members do not cheat. Because the, the nature of the pool is, if anybody is allowed to cheat, all the members lose funds. So, uh, what, what you would not want is a voting pool that consists of five members that are all controlled by the same individual. Because that's not really a voting pool. Because that that would not work because that's one person who could just steal the funds. 
Okay, we do just connect the two, okay. two dots on each Okay, so let's say uh, how like uh, somebody cheats. How do I lose money if I'm a competing server? Because the the like deposits that are in, the deposits that are in are in one bucket, and if you let somebody um, like process a withdrawal that is more than what they are supposed to have, now the pool doesn't have enough money to cover your funds either. So if you're if you're a exchange and you let um, let's say the exchange has a hundred thousand bitcoins in the pool, but there's there's this other server that only is it should have 20,000 of them. If you let them withdraw 30,000 bitcoins, now the pool is short 10,000. And that's going to come from you somehow because well, okay, there, so there so could be like a scramble to get it, but somebody somebody who's not that server is going to lose bitcoins. But why would you then enter a pool? Well, you would enter the pool because your customers would want that security. The thing that the pool provides to the end users is the assurance that the server cannot lose or steal their funds. So uh, a common thing that has happened in Bitcoin is someone will start a service, they'll run it for a while, they'll get a good reputation, they'll get lots of customers, and then one day, poof, they're gone. That's, I mean, I can't count the number of times that's happened. That's a scenario that uh, is very difficult to achieve in a voting pool. I'm never going to say it's impossible. But if all the entities are separate and they're all auditing each other, uh, it would take a lot of simultaneous failures to allow someone to just run off with all the money. Especially if you, uh, especially if the pools are diverse, if they're located in different countries, different time zones, run by different publicly known entities, you can, uh, and as they grow larger, the number of people who would have to collude goes up. So the risk can never be brought to zero. Your coins will always be safest under an address you control, but you know you can't do a lot. You can't do as much with them. So as long as people want to use off-chain, fast, you know, trading engines and exchanges, we can do a lot to just reduce that risk of handing over funds. And if the users want it bad enough, then the exchanges will implement it. For the exchanges, there's a PX side as well, right? Like, like there is, there is the, the crypto asset or cryptocurrency side which can be assured through a voting pool. But for a server itself, or for, for an exchange, there's a fiat side as well. How yeah. would that work? How would, how would a problem with the fiat side work if, if for some reason a server loses money on the fiat side? How does that affect the pool? Yeah, the problem with using cryptography to secure legacy currencies is that they have really bad APIs and aren't good at solving the double spending problem. Uh, I mean, we really can't. Uh, we can't use a voting pool to, st to manage fiat, so we can't use it to secure it. Um, there are some maybe ways to sidestep the problem. Uh, some people in the space have proposed like gateways, like trusted issuers that issue cryptographic tokens, like maybe colored coins that represent fiat. And then they would be separate energy entities from the exchanges that, like, you'd send fiat to a bank or some sort of financial service and you'd get colored coins. And then you could have exchanges that trade these colored coins for bitcoins. That's one way to do it. You know, once, once you, if you, the colored coins can be managed by voting pools. So that would be no problem. You'd protect both sides. But ultimately, there's always going to be an issue with fiat that you just can't. As long as fiat exists, it's going to be a problem. Does it, doesn't that become a problem for, suppose there are three exchanges that are wanting to create this voting pool. Mm -hmm. They can be sure of each other's accounting through triple entry accounting and voting pools that their accounting for cryptographic assets is, is correct every five yeah. years. But they cannot be fundamentally sure whether the other exchange is accounting or is protected against any fiat losses. So why would, so how would they, how would these three exchanges come together and make a pool if they're not sure of the fiat the, side? The, the fiat side is really a separate problem. And one of the things that would happen is if you lose the fiat, then it just disappears from the bank. But that doesn't automatically translate into a Bitcoin loss. Because uh, the way this would work in practice, each user on, on an exchange, they're controlling the private keys. The trading engine 
can't access any of those bitcoins at all. It can, the only way the trading engine can act on bitcoins is if a user, if their user's client signs a message sending some of their balance to a trade engine. So uh, in that case, like one of the things that's been hypothesized is that uh, if an exchange loses fiat, then they would just put in straw buy orders and uh, uh, basically buy it off the Bitcoin side and maybe move uh, Bitcoins from, you know, bit, move funds from the Bitcoin side to the fiat side to pass audits at different times. That really becomes a lot more difficult in a voting pool because the trading engine only has access to the open limit orders and money that's been specifically given to it. It can't just claim Bitcoins and execute trades randomly. So you, you would get some, the, the amount of ways that an exchange could cheat would be cut down, but like if, if it's gone from the bank, then it's, you're really relying on the banking system and the legal system to recover that money. So um, let's assume you have loading, uh, five servers and um, so you have these auditing servers which are separate, but you can still, or someone can still find out where these servers are, right? Right. Because they broadcast transactions, or they sign at least transactions. Um, so what happens if, for example, someone manages to take down three of these, and unfortunately three or five signatures are needed, so right. basically all Bitcoins are stuck. So what's the scheme for backing up these keys, getting an alternative server online, which then can replace the other one, and you know, yeah. and basically continue off where the other left off. Right. The you know the first line you're right. Even our first line of defense is that you make it so that the attacker can't find the audit servers. But that you know it's just a first line of defense; it can fail. The second line of defense is cold storage. Most of the funds will be offline, and the the way it works is when you generate the public and private key pairs, the our current. Uh, re recommended implementation is you print them on separate pieces of paper and put most of them in, a, in an off-site vault. And then the ones that you're, uh, you, you have a small amount on-site that's maybe in like executive, you know, up CXO level control safe. And then you have the next one that will be that the employee is responsible for loading when the hot wallet comes out. So you, uh, that's a part, that's part of the procedure. You would, uh, the, the various servers would have to be careful about how they handle the private keys. So that even if, uh, even if, you know, major M servers get hacked, they only get the hot wallet. Yeah, but my question is rather, you know, all these paper wallets you're talking about, they're secured by multi-sig, right? They, right? they need to, you know, the, the CEO of this company cannot just take these paper wallets and go away. So what happens if, if an attacker actually just takes down enough servers so no Bitcoins can be spent because we don't get together three or five signatures, only two, which isn't enough. So right. how at do that you, point, the pool can't process withdrawals. Exactly. So how and do you get it back up and yeah. how, what's the scheme for that? As long as, as long as M servers in the pool have kept their backups, you can manually recreate the transaction server. I mean, the keys are kept in like on physical paper, so it would, if you know, if every pool member is printing two copies, you would have to have so many paper copies lost that the odds are very low. But you know, again, you can't get the risk to zero. Uh, maybe all the maybe all the servers are sto are in one area, and a giant asteroid takes them all out. There's always going to be some care case, but uh, the odds would be very low in a especially in a large pool. There'd be so many copies. Uh, the, the question was denial of service by, yeah. by, by disabling uh, the majority of the old service. Well, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a majority, it would actually be M minus N plus one, right? So if, so if it's, let's say it's a seven of 10, you would need to disable four servers, right? Um, but in general, the same precautions that exchanges are already taking against DDoSs would apply. Uh, the, there, there's kind of two failures we look at in the voting pool case. There's the failures that can make it hard to access funds, and the failures that can make it that can cause you to permanently lose funds. And obviously, we care most about the permanent loss. Uh, we would we don't like services to go down because of DDoS, but that's not as severe as actually just losing the funds entirely. So 
Cloudflare, um, everything else that these servers would do. And also, on the audit server side, the, the limited access. Um, using BitMessage on one side to communicate with the pool, and then, say, Tor on the other side to communicate with the Bitcoin network. Um, you, you limit the bandwidth available for the attacker to get in. It's, it's layered security. You put in as many layers as you can. Okay, so thank you, Justice. It was a great presentation.